Welcome to Cinemaholics. Well, Ashton, I want to start with a question. Okay. Very, very strict question for strict. you. Okay. What? So what is like a movie that you feel like, like a movie you will never watch? Like you, you will never talk about on this show. You will never just like, mm -mm, it's never going to happen. You want to tell the listeners right now, like we're never going to talk about this movie. That, that way they know. So they don't have to like write in. Um, like a new movie or an older film? What, what's any the movie, any movie that exists since the late 19th century, 19th century. Um, well, I can't say I'm chomping at the bit to watch triumph of the will. I'm sure. Wait, it's, what movie is know, that? What triumph of the will triumph of the will? What, what, what is that? You don't know what triumph is it about the will you? Is? No, that's the Hitler propaganda film. with oh, Lenny, that Lenny Reifenstahl made. Oh yeah. From the thirties. Yeah, I'm. I'm not really, you know, Jones, and to watch that film, I have to admit, I have heard of this. This, oh yeah, I would I hope just you looked have it up. at least as far as like film history, it's very important. Well, the poster, the poster is like iconic because uh, I'm gonna look it up. I remember it's like a soldier or something like a Nazi, and it's like a very know. propagandistic. Yeah, it's it's well, it is propaganda. That's well, so what you is. wouldn't, but you wouldn't watch it just out of like a historical insight into I don't know. you know. I mean, I, I'm assuming what you're asking or what you're leading to is I'll pretty much watch anything. Like, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't watch. Um, I mean, I've already seen it, but I wouldn't watch Birth of a Nation again. That was my second choice I was going to make. Yeah. I mean, that's just. Are you talking about the original Birth of a Nation or the one yeah. that uh, came out in 2016? I never did see the Nate Parker one either. But... Nate Parker. That's a, Yeah. I couldn't remember the guy's name. Um, I have no interest you know, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, this is good. We're we're teaching the listeners a little bit about ourselves. What are the lines? It's good to draw them so we can break them later. I, I'm going to be honest. I feel like if Liam Neeson was listening to this episode, he'd be a little uh, disturbed that we're starting this review off with conversations <laughs> about birth of a nation and started. triumph of the will. <laughs> Liam Neeson, I guess that's your, your not-so-subtle cue to get me back on track because we are supposed to be talking about memory. Why did you ask that question, if I may ask? I don't know. It just popped up in my head. Sometimes I, th I think of questions and I want to ask them. Okay. It's weird. I know. I thought you were like leading. It was like a leading question no, no, or something. I very rarely have a plan. Well, <laughs> okay. I don't know what you expect from me at this point, five years into this show. Um, I thought, see, I, the question I thought you were going to be asking is like, what happens when you watch a movie and you need to review that movie mm -hmm. and that movie instantly ceases to exist? By time you need That's to, one way to do it. Sure. review that m movie because I feel like memory is a type of film, and we'll talk about more in a bit. That it happened, like I saw it, you saw it, we watched it. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But if you had told me, oh, that movie didn't actually happen, you just had a dream, you passed out for a few hours, and well, I'm gonna you be honest, envisioned well, a film. I've been anticipating this. I've been anticipating like this conversation because we talked last week. Like, oh yeah, we'll talk about memory as like a little bit of an extra thing, but. I knew I was like, I'm going to forget so much about this movie. You're going to forget so much about this movie. So I'm just going to get this out of the way. I've, I highly doubt we're going to talk about the actual movie very much. I'm more interested in talking about Liam Neeson and Martin Campbell and Guy Pierce and just sort of sure. being like, yeah, this movie came out and giving it a few sentences if we must. But I have other things I want to talk about. I don't know about you. I want to have fun. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm I was kind of excited for this conversation because I figured the movie itself was probably going to take uh, less priority than anything that we'll just spew mm -hmm. out during this whatever half hour, however long we talk. Yeah, you probably like when I asked that first question, you're like, oh, thank God, you know, like I'm just you were delaying the conversation about memory <laughs> with yeah. this asinine question John just asked. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, I, I, you know what, if I had to like shoehorn, you know, and force an angle onto that earlier question. Maybe there is, you know, something to be said about like, when are we going to say enough is enough with Liam Neeson's, you know, decades since taken, he comes out with taken, which good movie. I mean, I, I really like that movie. I was rewatching part of it a couple months ago. Cause somebody had it on at a party and, you know, everybody knows me. I'm Mr. Introverted. I was like, all right, I'm going to go watch a little bit of taken. Cause uh, mm -hmm. I need, I need some, some space. But yeah, um, that's uh, I have a similar experience watching Mad Men season two that way. Which movie? 
not movie, the show Mad Men. Mad Men. The second season of Mad Men, I have uh, seen in part because it was on a TV in the background once. You got spoiled. I saw clips of it. Yeah. Uh, that's, how, that's how to hear. But um, so Taken, Which that was about 2010, right? Uh, 2008, right? 2008. Oh, yeah, you're right. 2008. Good good year for movies. Um, yeah. So, One of my favorite movies of all time came out that year. Oh, yeah. Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian. <laughs> Not that one. I was just thinking of another Liam Neeson. I feel like Prince Caspian, though, is like right smack and dab in the middle of like if there's like a tier of like this is the best movies up top here. Here are the absolute worst movies I watch. Prince Caspian's probably right in the middle. Like, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> That's kind of funny. It exists. Yeah. 2008. I, I genuinely I think that was that was a fun year. I mean, we had Iron Man. We had The Dark Knight. I know for me, like I was graduating high school that year. Right. So that summer was like the first summer I had as an adult. And so I was going to the movies more often than ever. And I remember like going to see Pineapple Express with my friends. I remember going to see even the bad movies were fun, you know. Uh, well, not a bad movie, but I think Speed Racer came out around that time. I remember loving that. But then also yep. um, <laughs> the mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor and the, the one Indiana with, uh, Jones Jet Kingdom Lee. of the Crystal Skull. What? Mm -hmm. The one with Jet Li. Yeah, yeah. And I remember those movies sucked, but it was fun. It was a fun I year. I, I still go the bat for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I haven't seen it since I saw it that summer. But oh, that, that movie, movie that movie was... lost me so quickly. Wow. The really? fridge. All right. I don't know. It, it, when, when the, the fridge, what? the part with the fridge and the nuclear bomb, I was like, oh, why oh do God. people get take so much issue with the fridge scene? I really don't get it's no r more ridiculous than anything like in Temple of Doom. <laughs> it's no more ridiculous than anything in Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom, though, I think I think the level of like chaos energy in that movie and i just rewatched it a couple years ago to drive in there's something about the mood and the atmosphere that kind of matches that kind of like i just feel like the fridge is like it, it's a bridge too far it's like right See, over that line the scene where shia labeouf is like swinging on the rope or the you know like with like the various like wildlife monkeys and all that i feel yeah, like that's cartoon. way more ridiculous They're very ridiculous and yeah. goofy and ages poorly Compared to the nuking the fridge scene, which I think is not that bad. I don't really get why people take issue with it. Well, you know it's, what? I'll let you rest your case there. Let's let's true. get back to Liam Neeson, I guess. Um, we'll talk about Indiana Jones when we discuss that fifth movie that's supposed yeah, to be coming Indy out five. next year. It's supposed to. I mean, we'll see. Yeah. It, next year's summer is shaping up to probably be, probably be a bigger deal than this year. But okay, so I'm looking at Liam Neeson's filmography since Taken. And I think, you know, the Taken sequels obviously were a big deal in terms of like okay he he is kind of establishing himself as like i can make these sort of budget action thrillers on the cheap and they all kind of have some bent to them i remember i was getting pretty tired of this formula over those years like i remember um because he would come out with something in the middle of things right like he'd be in like battleship or something like whatever there was like he would he'd have like a little bit role and like a million ways to die in the west but really his bread and butter was like taken to non-stop the gray the commuter uh run all night um there's so many uh what am i forgetting any ones i said uh, the ice wasn't there like a cold pursuit that was the one with the ice truck or whatever uh we yeah, talked about well, wait, no marks um cold pursuit was the one with Laura Dern. And then there was the Ice Road, which we talked about last Road. year. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, there was Black Light. Uh, it's just like one thing after another. It kind of reminds me of like, you know, like with Bruce Willis had like the VOD stuff or Nick Cage has like the the VOD sort of um, weirdo like action movies. What What's your take on all that? Um, like, what, would you say that the, that was the right call for, for Neeson? I feel like maybe more so than Bruce Willis, uh, Liam Neeson's career has had a weird uh, parallel to Charles Bronson. Mm -hmm. who, you know, Bronson was also, you know, doing a lot of dramatic films, a lot of critically acclaimed films, but usually it's like a bit or like a side player. He wasn't often always the lead. Uh, and I felt like that's, I mean, with the exception of Schindler's List, like normally Liam Neeson would be like prominently seen in a lot of big movies, but in like a supporting role, like in Phantom Menace or Batman Begins, like, you know, he's like this mentor figure, this sort of sage wise man who's, you know, proficient action, but never really given the spotlight. And then in a movie like Taken, it's a great opportunity to play against type. You know, like you see this sort of guy who, you know, he grew up in Ireland. He clearly, you know, like 
had kind of a rough and tumble upbringing and he brought that edge and that vulnerability along with the dramatic chops to a movie like Taken, which is a movie I love, but I can really see why that led to his blooming second half or like second chapter of his career, because it's very easy to see that film and be like, that is really sharp casting. It had a great trailer just Mm -hmm. playing that scene where it's like him on the phone. It's like perfect trailer. That's like all you need to know about that movie. I mean, that movie just moves, you know? Like all the set pieces, all the the intrigue, the drama. It, you can look at the, the movies that come after, and they just don't have that same slick engine of a premise, you know. Sure, um, but like Charles Bronson, like as Death Wish became such a big film, it kind of led to this bizarre career where it's like now he's like this prominent action lead, certified action guy, but he's you know late in his fifties now, probably in his early sixties, pushing seventy doing these action tents of movies and some movies can play that to their advantage. But a lot of times like with him, like he did the death wish sequels and it's got more and more ridiculous and more and more violent with like, you know, him using more guns and all these different things. Cause you know, he can't really do as much action intensive stuff. So the movies themselves kind of reflect the sort of like weathered haggard energy that the actors bring into it. And I think with Liam Neeson, uh, movies like The Grey and uh, A Walk on Tombstones are the better ones that have come out from this phase in his career because they're basically just dramas with action thriller beats and they play into like some really emotional, vulnerable stuff for them. That, that's what Taken was, right? Because it was it was more about right. the father, the estranged father, estranged daughter dynamic. That was why that movie had a, a soul to it. Sure. But I think, the, I, in my opinion, The Grey is probably the best to come out of this phase. And I'd probably put a walk on the tune. So the most introspective. Yeah. And I think that, that those movies are a little bit better for me. But everything else has been like never quite terrible. But it's always just kind of like at, at some point you kind of feel like you're just watching a grandfather trying to punch and kick his way around people who are now like three decades younger than him. Yeah. They're like mid-level just, dad movies. We get better yeah. dad movies, honestly. They're did, all red box movies now. I'd yeah, say. basically. Did did you did you would you have wished that the Death Wish remake would have had Liam Neeson? I know he was considered for it. Um, it would have among been, a lot of other people, but I think better. It would have been maybe two on the nose, but mm-hmm. at least it would have been better. I mean, certainly that Death Wish movie just came and went, like made no impact. Um, you know, it, it didn't really have any you know, cultural yeah, we didn't relevance even, I don't to remember it. talking about it on the show. I don't know. If, I didn't I don't remember yeah. watching it. I think you might have I saw seen it. it. Yeah. It's just what it's just not good. Hmm. Just, there's not really much to say about it, but would have been better, I guess. But like I said, like, I feel like his death wish was just taken. So I don't know what would have like he would just be doing the same thing. But then again, yeah. like all these movies are fairly interchangeable already. Like you could have told me memory was called Black Light or Ice Pursuit or and or Ice, Pursuit, Ice Storm Ice or Pursuit, Cold Pursuit. Just, just merging yeah. them together. <laughs> yeah. But you know what I mean? Like these yeah. feel interchangeable now. Like they're just like you, you could tell me, you know, any of these movies are the other. And I would probably believe you because, you know, what they're just kind of relying on the same formula at this point. They change a few details. I feel like at least three of them now have been like, all right, this is my Unforgiven. I'm done. I'm out of this game. And then he comes back with another one of these, like another six of these movies. Mm-hmm. And so. Yeah, memory is just yet another one of these. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth mm. worth pointing out that this is also a man who has turned out some extraordinary roles. I mean, even in this last decade, he'll show up in something like Widows, where he, he's barely in it, but his his entire impression on the film is unmistakable. It's like throughout the entire movie, he lingers there. Same deal with Silence. He's barely in Silence, but that movie kind of hinges on him and his relationship with the Andrew garfield character right and then uh what, what was another one that he did in the last decade um i'm forgetting uh not uh oh yeah ballad of buster scruggs um he had that like segment i think it was the meal ticket one you know it's just like he's still this incredible actor you know turning out incredible performances it's just like they're sort of sprinkled within all of these sort of spectacle movies or like you know he'll show up in something like lego movie and have fun and everybody loves fun but uh, and then he'll do these sort of like, you know, low rent thrillers, these red box movies, as you put it, I guess I kind of yeah, miss um, I kind of for his next stage. I want something like, you know, a little bit more like resting on him as a lead actor. That's more fun. You know, something like a team, 
I, I, did, I thought 18 was fun mm-hmm. and he was, he was a fun it. lead in that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Because I don't think yeah. we're, we're going to ever have like a, okay, every year, every couple of years, we get like a big Liam Neeson, you know, vehicle that's like art house, that's like silence, you know, or something like that. Mm-hmm. But I would settle for him kind of being in like Qui-Gon Jinn again, not literally, <laughs> but, you know, sort of being in that mode as an actor. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of wondering if that's the next progression at this point, because it feels inevitable that he's just going to go back to that mentor figure, especially if he can't really do a lot of action intensive movies as he pushes towards 70. As we see in memory, I mean, he's kind of I, he, he's kind of struggling in this movie to really sell the ultra machismo that mm-hmm. I think came a little bit easier to him before. Right. Yeah. Um well, I was going to say uh, to our earlier discussion point, two other things I really appreciate uh, with his career of late is um, he's been doing some good voiceover or voice work. I mean, uh, comedically in the Lego movie and then dramatically with the monster calls. I think those are both very strong vocal performances from him that I wanted to highlight. And also, I think as just as an action star, his better stuff outside of the two movies I mentioned before are the ones that he did with the uh, John Collette, Sarah or um the guy just did Dun- jungle cruise recently do you know who i'm talking about he did like non-stop yeah yeah um i, th- I think uh, it's like I- i'm looking it up because i don't want to say it wrong. i think you're talking about journey colette smara but i i always get it yeah, like that's it. messed up with uh jo- jesse small i i'm just i'm i'm trying to be careful here uh, right uh, and i mean oh oh uh yeah. yao me yao me uh yeah yao, yao me yeah um, yeah, I mean, I think of the ones that he's done with him, probably nonstop and the commuter are the best, but I mean, run all night and unknown mm. are probably better than most of the ones he's done. I didn't like any of these movies. I, I gotta be honest. Like I, I well, not especially the, the commuter, commuter are just goofy. Uh, the commuter, I, I think is one of the better ones just cause it's so goofy and so over the top that I think it just has the right energy. I feel like these other ones get too self-serious. I do. That I do like that aspect have, of commuter. Sure. But. Uh, still i i just feel like the again it's like you you're missing what like what i was talking about earlier that soul that taken has you know i think it's kind of trying to peek through in this movie memory you know like trying to you know a hitman trying to sort of like rectify his past but like using so many other movies to do it it's like be your own thing you know like i felt like i was not watching a movie i was watching like a stitching of like 10 movies uh do do you agree yeah well i mean uh it's worth noting that this movie is in uh, another english language remake this one of mm-hmm. uh, i believe a danish film from 2003 called the memory of a killer which i have not seen uh, Same i don't here. know about you um so i can't compare it to, i was gonna try to watch it before this review but didn't get a chance unfortunately but uh i mean that's not exactly what you're referring to like i think uh, the big thing is that for Liam Neeson, this already feels like territory he's covered, like both the, you know, like we say, he's doing the Taken thing all over again. And the memory thing is an unknown movie I just mentioned. So mm-hmm. that that's like kind of like, you know, like that's like a C grade by design Liam, ne- Liam Neeson movie here. And then you got, like you said, elements from other better movies from the last like uh, decade or so being like Memento or like maybe zodiac or you know any of these kind well, of memento you know, it, it's so hard to parse because memento that's 22 years ago that movie comes out and it also has uh, guy, guy pierce. pierce yeah it's like you see guy pierce you see the memory thing you see the writing on your hands and arms it's just like what the heck <laughs> what do they think we haven't seen that movie it's just a little bit too you know i don't know I, it, it was it was a struggle for me to it was it was my fridge moment you know from indiana jones sure uh can we talk about martin campbell Sure. I've been meaning to talk about Martin Campbell on this on we this very show. We talked about uh, the Jack the Chan one with Maverick. I remember we did. We talked about the Foreigner. And the Foreigner. That's right. Uh, yeah, not a bad movie. I remember. I think it was quite all right. You uh, you two were kinder to it than me, but I remember thinking Jackie Chan's performance in it was good. Yeah, yeah, it was a good dramatic performance. It was kind of it was cool to see him in a dramatic. You know, uh, the the reason I want to talk about this guy is because Martin Campbell's directed some truly terrific films. Uh, my favorite film of all time, my number one. It's always up there battling with The Apartment, Billy Wilder's Apartment. 
Um, but my number one film, The Mask of Zorro, because as I've talked about on Cinemaholics, it has everything that I love in movies. It has the swashbuckling, the action, Antonio Banderas. I mean, it has everything I love when it comes to film. And, you know, the prototypical superhero. Um, and, and in that movie, too, it's it's. I think Martin Campbell had a vision with that movie. He was able to blend, you know, the the pastiche of like the matte paintings, the the sweeping, you know, 50s era film language with the modern action spectacle that he perfected arguably in GoldenEye. Um, and that's the other thing. He directed two of the best James Bond films of all time, GoldenEye and Casino Royale. A lot of people would say Casino Royale, the best one ever made and probably the best one with Daniel Craig. So how do you, how do you, or how do I, I guess I should say, how do I reckon that against some of the other films this guy's made? He made Edge of Darkness with Mel Gibson, horrific film, uh, truly truly bleak stuff uh green lantern one of the worst uh, superhero yeah, movies was of bad. this era yeah yeah i i am not quite as negative on edge of darkness as you are but it's not a movie i'm willing to defend it's, i think it's just okay i think it's pretty bad uh <laughs> right. and, you know i think uh, i'd have to rewatch a vertical limit because uh, i saw that when i was a bit younger i don't really have much of an that opinion the, on it. the like mountain movie mm-hmm yeah. Okay. I, I've seen the poster, the, D, the the VHS cover for that a billion times, but I've never watched it. It's very Martin Campbell, you know, Chris O'Donnell stars in it with Bill Paxson. And, you know, it's, it's one of those movies I'm sure I, I actually I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it ages or like how it holds up or doesn't. Um, but the guy's career, you know, he, he also made Beyond Borders with uh, Angelina Jolie. Didn't really make that much of a slash oh. with uh, Clive Owen. Um, yeah, that one's like, is that like notoriously pretty bad? Because that was like supposed to be like an awards contender and it. Yeah, it kind of crashed really and burned bad. a bit. Uh, yeah. He did a sequel to Mask of Zorro after that, Legend of Zorro, which I, I defend, even though I know it's trash. It's my trash. It belongs to me. Um, I, and I think one of the main problems with that movie is like, I mean, the screenwriters are Roberto Orchi and Alex Kurtzman. And I think that this was like prototypical, like franchise building, which just really burned that movie you really lose all of the like the romantic sensationalist just like spectacle of mask of zorro legend of zorro is just like a legacy kind of sequel before those things were really invented sure um, um were there a lot of monks in that movie yeah there were they were there were plenty. i remember learning a decent bit about monks watching that movie and that's <laughs> the only thing i remember about that's it. funny i remember soap being a major plot point in the legend of zorro which for reasons that i will never understand uh, explosive soap and then uh, but then he comes out with Casino Royale and it's just like, oh, yeah, you know, it's Martin Campbell, you know, this guy like he can craft a blockbuster unlike any other person uh, working today. And then his string of movies after that have just been one dud after another. I mean, at, like I said before, Edge of Darkness is 2010 Green Lantern right after that. Neither of them hit the foreigner, you know, his movie first movie in six years. Six well, yeah, years he down. was in director's jail for Green Lantern. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then he was in it again because he was uh, he did make another movie for four years uh, with the protege, which launched last year. I wasn't able to see it. I heard it was trash, yeah. but my trash. Oh, really? I mean, the trail looked like trash, but then I've heard people be like, it's actually better than you'd think. So I haven't seen it, um, but I heard it wasn't it, it's not as bad as you might think. So then where where do we square the peg that is memory? Is memory yet like another peg? Is, is it another blip? on his director's jail, you know, well, rotunda, or is it, you know, something, uh, maybe it's a little bit better than we're giving it credit. I don't know. Why are we grading it? If, on the I, if I may say so, I think Martin Campbell is in the truest sense, a journeyman director. He kind of just bounces the project to project, uh, in the studio, you know, whatever comes flying at his desk, but he wasn't if always right. He has uh, flashes of not being that kind of director, of being I a director with a vision. But every once in a I, very blue moon. I think he's tried to move outside of it, but I don't know if he's ever moved out of it before. Outside of like, you know, he makes like a big prominent film, like you said, a Mask of Zorro, a Casino Royale, a Golden Eye or whatever. It's like, OK, he's back. This is Martin Campbell. And then he does another thing in a flops and he's like all right well back to square one i feel like his career is always like that because beyond borders i think kind of put him in director's jail until he got the casino royale gig because they're like well you did golden eye well why don't you just do bond again and then that really worked out and then he you know like you said edge of darkness and green lantern came out and it's like well 
back to square one, bud. You know, I feel like that's kind of the push and pull of his career for his whole uh, his whole career. So um, with this one, I, I think it's, you know, kind of on a scene by scene basis. There are some scenes in this that I think you watch and you're like, OK, clearly someone who knows what they're doing is behind this. Probably the most from an action sense, probably the best example is the um, parking garage scene where like Liam Neeson, you know, something tragic happens and he like goes ham and, you know, like, it's like you watch a scene like that. And it's like, OK, maybe this movie's going to pick up. Maybe Martin Campbell is like back in action now because the first like. 30, 40 minutes of this are a slog. It's just... Yeah, they're pretty sleepy. No energy, no enthusiasm from a directorial sense. Liam Neeson, like we said, is kind of doing his uh, sloggy internal guy uh, on the outs thing. There's a a, a kind of nice scene with him and his brother. Uh, But other than that, like the the beginning of the movie, just there's nothing really going on. And then that action scene happens. It's like, okay. Yeah. Maybe some stuff's going to start happening. Maybe things are going to start cooking. They're, well, and they're then dueling the gets- cold opens, and neither of them are very interesting or engaging. I mean, like, mm-hmm. the, the first one is just like a hit. Uh, he's a hitman, and he he literally assassinates someone in one of the most boring ways possible. You know, like, there's no sort of tension. There's no sort of, like, is he going to get pulled, away uh, with it? The Joker in The Dark Knight, where he, like, <laughs> pretends to be a, uh, a medical assistant. And yeah. But that's the thing, it's like, you could see how the Joker in the Dark Knight, like that cold open, that probably was something more straightforward when they first drafted it. But they kept adding to it. They kept really be like, how do we make this more interesting? How do we step this up? How do we make this feel a little bit more unique? And like, this is Joker, you know, like that's the kind of thing that this movie is missing. It's missing the that like the director caring enough or the, the screenwriters caring enough to really sort of be like, OK, how do we how do we add some, oomph, you know, to this story that like we are adapting, you know, like do they had arguably free reign it's not like this is like a super well-known you know attitude i know it's based on a novel as well so i don't know i don't i don't get why i i I strikes me as like he didn't really care that much about making this movie just like you know here's the paycheck i guess so i don't really know because i mean the premise is kind of interesting but it's also it's a hard one to translate that's why i was curious to watch the original one because by design, it just seems like a very depressing idea for an action film. Like a guy yeah. with severe early onset Alzheimer's is like, you know, trying to protect like children from sex abuse. And he eventually gets involved with the detectives. And it's like, you know, I mean, like it, it just it seems like a hard sell to me on paper. I guess that's why they had to be like, well, this other version worked in 2003. So we're just going to kind of follow that template. But I don't know how much it veers away from that or how much it's close to it. That's why I was curious to watch the original one. I imagine, you know, I don't know either, but I did get like heavy Steve Larson vibes, you know, very girl with the dragon tattoo, very much like, you know, anything bad can happen. If it's bad and something bad is going to happen to a character, it's going to happen. It's just very bleak that way. And there is a way to do that. There is an appetite for that. I think, you know, we don't, we don't, they don't know how have, they don't all have to be uplifting, you know, happy go lucky movies or they don't have to have the quip you know centric quip quip heavy scripts you know this isn't trying to be commuter i guess this is this is trying to be a little bit more of like a downbeat but maybe sort of like profound make you think kind of uh action thrillers but like you said i think the action thriller element is not very pronounced i mean it really is just a it's a drama first and foremost right and not a very interesting crime drama like i don't know this movie plays around with sort of like taking justice into your own hands and like it kind of raises these questions but does it really it's like the alzheimer's thing as well it doesn't really say anything much about these things anything new or you know or take these points and like present them in a way that makes you think it's just sort of like here it is and yeah that's why it's like it's easy to kind of watch this movie and forget you watched it and and it doesn't really have much of an impression and to, to me it's like well, well then why make the movie like what what is this movie really doing for anybody is it really going to entertain people you know for a couple hours and to what end i guess yeah i mean i don't know i'm I'm kind of getting the vibe that Liam neeson wants to end this action career of his but he wants to end it on a good note and it feels like he's just kind of like trying to figure out what that movie is and i'm taken assuming four. that's why he's keep what was it taken four well that'd be but the like a is like a four. So of course, yeah. Tay four it can <laughs> to forkin. To forkin. Uh to forkin. Um 
Yeah, I don't know. It just feels like, yeah, I feel like he's trying to get like that next take in that next like death wish or that next like unforgiven type movie where it can end on a grace note and then he can go back to doing like dramas or i know he was also thinking about doing uh naked gun remake so maybe he'll just go in like the liam neeson or sorry leslie nielsen um route and like just do like broad comedy he certainly has done stuff with seth mcfarland already so i you know, he's, he's capable. sure so i don't know i mean Maybe that's what's in the cards. I don't know. I I, I wonder about that, though, because I feel like for like three or four years now, he's had interviews where he's just like, yeah, I'm winding down like I'm almost 70. I can't keep doing these action movies. And then like six more come out and then he'll do an interview for one of them. It's like, yeah, you know, I got to figure out when I'm going to end this. You know, I need to wind down. I can't keep doing this. And then like six more come out. It's like, okay, well. Are you going to wind down or are you go, you get ramped up? I feel like you're making more of these every time you say you're going to wind down. So I don't know. Well, I mean, are you looking forward to the that movie Marlo that he's going to be in? Uh, I don't actually know what he has coming up. So is that the next film? Yeah, the film he's, is? yeah Philip, he's, he plays Philip Marlowe, the uh, the Raymond Chandler oh, director. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Or detective. Well, that could be good, maybe. It could be good. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm I kind of interested in something like that because it's a little bit different for the guy. Um, his Another movie he's doing is called uh, Retribution, um, which is like another, but it's kind of more of like a another remake. So, you know, I, I get the sense that it'll probably be like kind of a thriller in the vein of memory. So I don't know. And then the only other film I've seen from him coming up is called In the Land of Saints and Sinners, which I actually, I honestly don't know anything about that one. But yeah, I... I I don't know. I for me, it's like the guy. He hasn't been in a Marvel movie, and you know, every time he's tried to like be more of a fixture of a franchise, it hasn't quite worked out, right? Like Men in Black International. I think that was you know maybe for him his ticket into like okay, that's a pretty steady paycheck. And the Men in Black movies usually do pretty well, but then International ended up being uh, quite a failure, right? And I can't really think of anything else like franchise wise he's been in that could sort of lead to anything. I mean, he hasn't been in well, any of the DC things since the dark Knight. Yeah. I don't know. Would, would he, ever, would he, would he be part of like the fast and furious franchise or something? Would he, you know, is, is there something uh, I'm kind of missing there? Is he going to be in a Pixar? Uh, has he not before? I'm trying to think, I guess he hasn't yet. Uh, like I said, I no. mean, I think he's a pretty good voice actor. He has a very distinct he's voice. Done, so. Yeah, he's been, like I mentioned, like the Lego movie. He did like the nut job. And then um, he was also obviously oh, he, the Star the Wars franchise job. was huge for him. Um, Who could ever forget the nut job? Um, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think the other the only real times he's prominently been a franchise outside of that uh, Men in Black spinoff was uh, Star Wars and um, uh, Batman Begins. And like those are like adversary roles you know or villainous roles yeah. i think clash um, of the titans he was well, kind of you know he was in two of those i guess he's not a villain in uh star wars per se but you know he, he he's someone who doesn't make it out to the credits and that seems to be a pattern with his franchise wait, wait, work, what he doesn't I, oh you spoiled me <laughs> well i haven't seen any of the star wars movies yeah man um looking forward to it sure uh yeah i don't know i mean i don't really know what's up for the guy i mean is he gonna like you know keep pursuing lead roles or is he going to kind of try to go for back that supporting stuff i mean is he winding up or winding down i really don't know well we have him on the line right now we're going to bring him in um i'm excited i i've been meaning to talk to liam you know i've been hoping he would answer my calls and uh usually he just like leaves cryptic messages but here he is liam neeson on the line we're going to ask him about his career um no i actually i've never done a liam neeson impression i kind of don't want to attempt it because it could it could go pretty pretty horribly um why is it i don't know because it's like a halfway irish halfway english accent and i I need to practice well i'm uh, i'm not yeah i'm not equipped um if you can do it i by all means i uh i don't know if i can i don't know if i want to embarrass myself on the air I'm sure I'm uh, sure you wouldn't pursuit. be that. I, I mean, hey, I would not be embarrassed for you. Um, yeah. Let yeah. me let me try to work on it. OK. OK. Um, oh, you want me to do it right now? No, you don't have to. You don't have to. We can move on. So okay. All right. <laughs> um, I have nothing else to say. I mean, yeah, Guy Pierce is also in this movie. OK. You, I have nothing much not to bad. say. He's always good. Yeah, but he's, these, or Guy Pierce is always good. I have no opinion. complaints. Um, it's, um, it's Guy Pierce. He's our buddy. Um, it's it's yeah, nice to I see think, him as like an uncomplicated good guy, I guess, or like uncomplicated in the sense of like, okay, is he going to really be the villain like in uh, every other movie? 
Yeah, you know, he's got got some baggage. Sure, sure. Uh, I feel like Monica Belushi and Ray Stevenson are like a little bit cheekier than the other cast members, maybe because they're in supporting roles, but it feels like they're bringing a little bit more pulp to the equation than everyone else is. And that's welcome, but also kind of weird given their roles in the film. Yeah, like, it, it felt, just it felt feels like, like overcasting to me, um, especially yeah, I with don't Ray know. Stevenson. Well, Ray Stevenson, yeah, who we just uh, discussed in Triple R or RRR, uh, who I think they got perfect use of Ray Stevenson in that film. Like, oh, yeah. Know, playing up that, like like we said, that pulp, that kind of smarminess, I think, fit well. In this movie, Ray Stevenson's doing like a weird country accent it looks like he has like a fat suit on and he's just like occasionally doing like a southern draw but then like you know his his accent just comes back to normal and it's, it's a very bizarre performance but um otherwise yeah i don't know none of the performances really stood out to me i like taj Atwal. i mean i haven't seen her i don't, I don't think this, i've seen Is her in something before the detective beside Guy Pierce. Yeah, she plays who's yeah, she plays one of the Spanish. Yeah, the FBI people. Yeah. Yeah, she's alright. Yeah, I thought I thought she was she was an interesting character, interesting addition to the mix. And um there was another actor in it, um, I don't remember his name, the other detective who was kind of like, you know, kind of hanging out with everybody, kind of um he was like the he was like I think he was Hispanic and I, I don't remember his name, but he had a few scenes where I was like, oh, you know, this guy has like some chops, you know. I never totally had a full read on his character, to be honest, but I don't know. I thought that he, he was doing fine. Like nobody in this movie, I think, was like really bad or anything, I guess, right? Like unless you disagree. No, I mean, like I said, I mean, I thought Monica Belushi and Ray Stevenson felt like they're coming in at with a different energy, but thought, like their performances were bad right just maybe a little bit weird at times do we want to talk about this movie's box office i, I want to I see can't imagine you... it's uh <laughs> thriving it uh it hit wide release in the u.s uh, this past weekend through open road films and uh, i don't know how many theaters it opened in i think it technically opened wide so probably at least a thousand if i had to guess um, but yeah, well, I'm I'm curious. What do you think? Uh, what do you What do you think it, it grossed? What, what's like? Uh, you, you, I'll give you like do a range. How about that? Make it easier. Um, my guess would be four point five million. You are not far. It is three point two. Okay, uh, so mostly domestic. And I was lowballing it. <laughs> yeah, that that is very low. Uh, but I mean, it's such a low budget movie. I doubt you know this is STX uh, distributing it internationally. So I don't know how it's going to do overseas. It hasn't really made anything yet overseas, but uh, not much at least. And then I guess we can play the Rotten Tomatoes game because I feel like we we kind of covered it. But well, Rotten Tomatoes. We have sixty nine reviews counted. Sixty nine. What a number. Um, oh, you're going to say something nice. when I said 69? Nice. What are you going to say? I said nice. Oh, nice. Oh, it's nice to talk to you, too. I was going to try to do it in the Liam Neeson voice, but it didn't really come nice. out. So it was like, <laughs> nice. Um, okay. So, Will, what do you think the Rotten Tomato score is? Uh, the day we were recording this, I think uh, you, have, you have options. Uh, just going to throw out a random number and say 30 or sorry. Yeah, no, 37%. A little off, but not far. Uh, 30%. Okay. It's a bit lower. Oh, than wow. Okay, so lower. I'm going too high. Yeah, with yeah. The budget, or sorry, with the box office and with the Rotten Tomato score, I'm going too high with this. It movie. happens to the best of us. Uh, what about the audience score? Audience score, we have 100 plus verified ratings. I'm curious if you're going to get this. I feel like it's weirdly going to be like, okay, like 52%. It is 82%. Oh, 82. Wow. That was way off then. People yeah. are watching Memory and they're saying... You know what? I'm never forgetting this. I mean, if you're going into this as a lean, ne- like a fan of Lee Neeson's current work. Sure. It's no better and no worse than some of the other stuff he's done, really. I mean, I've heard Blacklight was terrible, but I didn't see it. Right. No, um, neither of us did. And I mean, this this one's pretty bad, but not like notably so. It's more mediocre than terrible. So, I mean, if this is if you like Lee Neeson's like the Marksman uh, Ice Pursuit uh, any of those, you know, or Cold Pursuit or no, uh, Ice Storm. Jeez Louise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, yeah, we don't have a cinema score. So sorry to disappoint you, but we do have Letterboxd. 
the, our, our favorite website on the internet. And this the, a low amount of watches, 791. That's one of the fewest watches on, I've ever seen on Letterboxd for a movie released in theaters wide. Like that is really, really bad. Um, but okay, average rating. Um, and usually when I look at the average rating, I see how many fans are there are of the movie. And it's usually in the hundreds. Um, there are zero for this. So I'm giving you a little bit of a hint, I guess, on how this is going to go. So what do you think the average rating is on Letterboxd? Um, 2.5? Very close. 2.4. So that tells you, I guess, what you need to know about the critical reaction to memory. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of like scanning the reviews on Letterboxd. And you're not going to believe this, but people don't like it very much. And uh, I see one. Here, here's a review with 31 likes, and it's a three and a half star. And, you know, uh, someone here, they're kind of like being like, oh, you know, Brian, De- mentioning Brian De Palma a little bit. Uh, OK, uh, well-worn uh, genre material, jo- well-worn genre material seems fresh and new, anchored by really impressive heartfelt Liam Neeson performance. OK, sure. So maybe that's the other side of the equation. Maybe that's maybe that's did, what uh, some people get out of it. Who knows? Did Liam Neeson write that review? <laughs> well, uh, hmm. it, the review is by L.N., and it's a picture well, <laughs> of Aslan. Yeah. So I don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that was the other franchise thing he did. He was Aslan. Well, we mentioned Chronicles of Narnia. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, that <laughs> that's everything we got from memory. Um, we have Doctor Strange coming out next. Will Ashen. That's the next big review, huh? Yeah. Is there- I'm seeing it Wednesday. Okay. You're seeing it Wednesday, I think. I'm yes, we're both seeing it same time. Um, the only same other, bat time. The only other movie coming out around this time. I mean, I know Hatching is going to be hitting. I think that I forget yeah, who made that. It. It's out. like IFC Midnight or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that came out near me. I know Petite Maman is coming out near me this weekend. I don't know if that's a wide release. Sure, or, I was going to ask you. It's like, okay, are we going to are we going to talk about Petite Maman in more detail? Because I think we did talk about. I don't remember if we reviewed it. I'd have to look. I mean, the I. I know you saw it at TIFF online last mm-hmm. year, uh, and I saw it at the uh, Three Rivers Film Festival last year during the fall. So we saw mm-hmm. it around the same time last year. Um, I feel like we talked about it, but we didn't go in depth with it. I'd be happy to talk about it if you wanted to talk about it after our Doctor I Strange think that would be review. Cool. But if, if we want to talk about something even newer, the movie that I'm most looking forward to, more than Doctor Strange, that hits limited release on the 6th, is happening have you uh, is that on your radar at all it is i french film requested that we play it at the theater where i work the harris theater and that is going to be playing the 20th so i think when uh i'm out of town that's when it's going to be playing a theater near me but i'm going to still try to see it when i get back yeah I i know a few people who have seen it and have you know really gone to bat for it um i think they saw it on like the festival circuit and yeah, it was at Sundance. I didn't get a chance to see it there, but I wanted here. to. Yeah, and I really want to see it, and I want to, you know, I'm I'm in the mood for a really good drama, uh, something a little bit more like, you know, highfalutin. So maybe that'll be a good companion to Doctor Strange if we can check it out. But that that hits May 6th in limited release, and then I think it'll hit streaming in June. But we we definitely we definitely have no shortage of movies coming out this summer uh if you haven't listened already our summer preview episode should already be out by the time you're listening to this so get on that that was a fun time um i have nothing else really though will coming out that's on my radar am i forgetting anything uh i guess my long promise liam neeson impression is yeah i mean that's that's left i've that's been waiting years for that um right. uh Let's see. So you said it's like a mix of Irish and British, right? It's like kind of like a yeah. It's like a little bit like it's a bit under your throat, and you have to kind of you know you have you you have to make sure that you're you're bringing your whole voice into it. You're you know Optimus Prime. See, now I thought it's more of like a back of the throat kind of thing where you you're a little weathered and it feels like you. It's getting a little Christian Bale in the Batman movies, though, isn't it? Oh really? I don't know. I mean. Uh yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not an impressionist. Uh, so, but that's that's I have a my uh, set of skills. Yeah, I, have I will find you. Skills, and I will guest on Cinema Holics. Of course, Liam Neeson. Oh, that'd be We'd a love big to have get. Him. Yeah, it'd be good. I would be happy to have him on. I hope he'd come on for a non Liam Neeson movie. Of course. Like, oh, a hundred. Have him oh, on, we're on for, the same page. Have him on for Petite Maman. 
No, not Petit Mont. Are you, Will? You're being ridiculous again. What? No, we need him on okay. for Lightyear. Okay, yeah. Why I not? want his expertise when it comes to the space race. I want him to be like, here's the thing about Buzz Lightyear that I just I found confusing about the movie. It, it's just that you know, Infinity and Beyond. Mm-hmm. No, no, I no, told no. you that uh, John Campia said that Lightyear is going to get nominated for Best Picture, right? Yeah, you know, we all have our statements i don't even know what to, to make of that but i would i just have this like wonderful impression in my head of just like liam neeson just kind of comparing his work on the nut job and lego movie to a pixar movie i just i want that <laughs> you know? okay i thought i thought you were gonna say comparing that work to his work in silence like you know like I'm sure i'm sure he we're would. all a little nutty <laughs> just like the jesuits <laughs> i guess on that note we'll see y'all on the next one